I want to talk this morning about Jacob Schiff. Jacob Schiff was a very famous person who today very few people know anything about. But he lived until 1920. And the period 1880 to 1920 has been referred to in American Jewish history as the Schiff era. He was that important that the whole era was named after him. And I want to talk about him today because I think he is an example, a paradigm, a perfect example of a Jewish leader uh, who devotes his life to helping the Jewish people and all the things that he did. And when we learn more about Jacob Schiff, you might even discover that there's something in your past of your family that has something to do with Jacob Schiff. I know I do, and I'll share that with you. A hundred years ago, everyone had heard of Jacob Schiff. Today, like many things in Jewish history, very few people remember him. However, he was somebody that I think we should study and understand. In short, he was a Jew who came from Frankfurt, Germany, came to the United States in the mid-1800s, became extremely wealthy, and besides being one of the richest people in the United States, in today's money I would call him a multi-billionaire. Uh, he devoted much of his time and much of his fortune to helping the less fortunate Jews. And he really was a person who dominated Jewish life in the United States in that period between the 19th century and the 20th century. There's a saying in the um, book of Proverbs, train up a child in the way that he should go, and even when he go, gets old, he will not go away from it. In Hebrew, chanoch lenar al pi darko, train up a child according to his way, gam ki yazkin lo yasur mimeno, even when he gets old, he won't stray. Now, I don't know if that's true or not true, I want to use Jacob Schiff as an example of a boy who was raised in a certain type of life, who grew up and went far away from that, and think about how much influence his early life had on him. Life is full of tests. I mean, if, if you were a multi-billionaire, you would have different tests than if you were a poor person. So let's go to the beginning. In the olden days, there was a ghetto in Frankfurt, Germany, and, they, and the Jews lived very crowded together. There was a certain duplex, a two-family house. Two families lived in this house. There were the Rothschilds and the Schiffs. The Rothschilds, in front of their house, put a red shield. That's what Rothschild means, red shield. The Schiffs put a ship, a Schiff sign in front of theirs. And they were next door neighbors who shared a duplex. Both the Rothschilds and the Schiffs were very Orthodox Jews. And they were both wealthy people. Moses Schiff, the father of Jacob Schiff, was a very Orthodox Jew who was supportive of a rabbi named Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch. Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch was a dynamic rabbi in the mid-1800s who revitalized Orthodox Judaism in Germany. And one of the key balabatim, one of the main lay leaders of his shul was Moses Schiff. And one of the things that Rabbi Hirsch did is he established a Jewish day school, like a modern Jewish day school that we have in America. And from 1853 to 1861, Jacob Schiff was a student in this day school, where they learned German subjects and also some Jewish subjects. Now, at the age of 16, he stopped going to school. He became apprentice, so to speak, into the family business, which was um, finance. And he decided that he didn't want to live in Germany. He felt that it was too small a pond. Jacob Schiff was a very ambitious young man, and he wanted to go to America, to New York. Now, there were lots of German Jews in New York who were in finance, people that he knew, so he could go there. His father did not want to let him go from Frankfurt to New York because he says, I'm afraid you will not be Shomer Shabbos. If you leave Frankfurt, you'll stop keeping Shabbos. And Jacob was very ambitious and he wanted to go 
but he didn't want to go without his father's blessing. And it took a few years until somehow he was able to decide that he was going to go. And at the, his brother gave him the money, his family supported him, but his father was very adamant and it was at the last minute, literally, when the coach was in front of the house to take him to the next start of his journey to go from Frankfurt to wherever you went to get a boat uh, that the father and the son reconciled. And the father gave him two things. He gave him $500, which in the mid-1800s is a lot of money, and he gave him a package of kosher meat for the trip. Probably like corned beef that wouldn't spoil. That was what he sent him to New York with, and he went to New York in 1865. I'll make it short, he got involved in, in finance, he was successful, he went back to Germany for business reasons, his father died, he went back to Frankfurt to be with his mother. After in, in Frankfurt he met somebody there who offered him a job uh, to go back to New York and be in his firm and with his mother's blessing he moved back uh, in 1875. He moved back to New York and he met a man named Abraham Kuhn, K-U-H-N. Kuhn was in partnership with a cousin by the name of Solomon Loeb, Kuhn Loeb. That's one of the major banking firms. So he met Mr. Kuhn, and it's an amazing thing that but within a short period of time he married Mr. Loeb's daughter. That is one way to become a partner. Um, he rose to very high social standards, status in, in New York society and because of that we became very wealthy with the Germans. The German Jews who were a higher class so to speak than the, than the poorer Jews who are coming from Russia later. But because he got very rich he did something that it has happened many times in Jewish history. He got less from. He became less strict in his orthodoxy. In fact, he joined Temple Emmanuel. Temple Emmanuel in New York is the main reform temple. If you are a wealthy German Jew in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, you belong to Temple Emmanuel. So even though he was raised in a very orthodox home, he became a member of Temple Emmanuel. He was no longer strictly kosher. He was no longer strictly Shomer Shabbos. But I want to talk about not, only, not how unreligious he became, but we'll see how religious he remained, despite, shall I say, the fact that he, he grew high and mighty. Uh, he davened every morning. You can imagine a guy, he's no longer strictly kosher because he's doing business with Rockefeller and with J.P. Morgan and with all these people. But he still puts on tefillin because his father told him back in Frankfurt, I want you to put on tefillin. And when he finished putting on the tefillin, every morning he took a picture of his mother and father that he had and he kissed it. He honored his mother and his father. This is an interesting thing. and. He made a lot of money. I'll give you an example. Uh, he was second, Kuhn Loeb was second to J.P. Morgan in finance back at the turn of the century. In 1901, he controlled his company 22,000 miles of railroad tracks and $312 million worth of railroad stock. In other words, today you talk about high tech. In those days, railroads was where the money was being made in finance. Not only owning the railroads, but writing the bonds for people who were building railroads, financing railroads, and many other things. And they were very, very up there. In 1903, they, had a, they bought a 22-story building in downtown Manhattan at the corner of William Street and Pine Street. 